Hello and welcome to an Ohio Learns 360 family webinar. I'm Amy Jurevich from WOSU Public Media. We're here today to discuss bullying awareness and prevention. One out of five students report being bullied each year. How can families identify when it is happening and what can we do to keep kids safe, happy, and healthy? Joining us for this discussion is Dr. Cricket Meehan, the director of Miami University's Center for School-Based Mental Health Programs. Welcome to the program, Dr. Meehan. Thank you for having me. And also joining us from the Ohio Department of Education is Dr. Jill Jackson, an education program specialist in the Office of Whole Child Supports. Welcome, Dr. Jackson. Good evening, and thank you for having me as well. And I'm sure everyone has their own idea of what bullying is. This event tonight is focusing on elementary school aged kids. So when it comes to young kids, what is bullying versus two kids just having, you know, a disagreement or not getting along? So Dr. Jackson, would you like to start us off by explaining what is bullying? Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity. I would like to reference um, the Ohio Department of Education's definition of bullying, harassment, intimidation for Ohio schools. Um, it says that harassment, intimidation, and bullying means either of the following. It's any intentional, written, verbal, graphic, or physical act that a student or group of students exhibit towards other particular uh, students more than once uh, and the behavior both causes mental and physical harm uh, of the other student is sufficiently severe, persistent, or pervasive that creates an intimidating, threatening, or abusive educational environment for the other student. Um, this also includes electronic act or means by um, um, committed through the use of a cell phone, computer, pager, any uh, personal communication um, device uh, or other electronic commu communication um, um, means. So that is what we have um, formally provided to Ohio schools as a de definition for bullying, harassment, intimidation, no matter the age grade. Okay, and Dr. Meehan, do you wanna weigh in a little bit about what is bullying? Maybe you can compare bullying versus teasing a little bit, like that kind of thing, especially because we're talking about elementary age kids. What is bullying versus just teasing? Yeah, so I think the definition that Dr. Jackson provided, I mean, that covers a lot of what we're looking for in terms of behavior. So just very succinctly, what when we're thinking of bullying, we're thinking of it having three key components. And so it's a behavior that is aggressive. It's hurtful behavior. Then behavior that is hurtful and aggressive can be other things as well. But there's two other parts that we want to pay attention to, to know that it really is bullying. One is that it typically is repeated. It's something that's happening over and over again. And adults may not always see the repetition, but in general, that repetition is there. So if we start to talk to our young children, they'll start to tell us that this has happened more than once to them. And then the final piece of that that I think is pretty critical to pay attention to, and this is really what distinguishes it, is an imbalance of power. So the person who is doing the bullying behavior has some level of power over the individual on the receiving end. So this is very different than two friends or two peers, for example, that are just talking to one another and they're maybe teasing each other and that sort of thing. So that's, that's a different kind of perspective than an imbalance of power where someone may be physically stronger than the other person, they may be intellectually uh, more intelligent, uh, they may have higher social standing in a group. Those are the types of things that we're thinking of with imbalance of power. So if we're seeing that, if we're seeing those three key pieces, again, aggressive, hurtful behavior, there's an imbalance of power and generally that it's repeated. So that's what constitutes bullying. Okay, now something like that, something being repeated and being aggressive, at the elementary school age, it could be hard for an elementary school student, the, how young they are, to really express what is happening because um, something simple like he stole my ball on the playground 
can seem very dramatic to a six-year-old, right? So um, how does a parent know if they keep hearing about the same kid, the repeated behavior, um, how does a parent know if it is actually re bullying, it is actually repeated behavior? Uh, so yeah, Dr. The, Jackson, go for it. <laughs> so one of the things that um, Dr. Meehan said is again, that repetition. So I always tell parents, that, okay, each time your student comes and shares with you about their school day and things that they have experienced, make and take note. So I always go through the five whys. Who, what, when, where, and why did this happen? And, and kind of have that conversation with your student and take note. And again, a one-time occurrence by definition is not bullying behavior, but you want to have those conversations and take note so that if on then tomorrow your student comes home and they say, um, you know, I had this experience at school and it didn't feel good. And then you say, well, who, what, when, where, why? And, how, you know, you kind of go through those five whys again. And then you start to see the pattern. It happened with the same person or in the same place at school or any of those five whys start to uh, look um, the same each time you start to have a pattern. And so again, having regular conversations with your little one, seeing how their day was, and then again, when incidents occur, kind of start to get that information from them around what I would say are those five whys, so that you can start to establish that pattern for reporting. Okay. Now, if you are just joining us, this is an Ohio Learns 360 webinar, and we're discussing, discussing bullying awareness and prevention. So um, Dr. Meehan, if you want to weigh in a little bit more about this idea of the repeated behavior, um, can you, t so Dr. Jackson was saying, you know, take note, remember names, that kind of thing. So if your child is, is bringing up the same name, you know, again and again saying, you know, I'm not getting along with this person or this person is, um, you know, not treating me well on the playground or in class, they keep stealing my paper and it's the same name over and over again. When does the parent talk just to their child about it or when does the parent need to talk to the school? It's a really great question. And I think building those relationships is critical. So being able to talk to your child or if you have a friend's child that you're close with, having those open discussions and open relationships really are going to be key. And as Dr. Jackson mentioned, you know, you really do want to dig into what are some of the details of what's happening. So what I would say is if you are noticing that you're hearing the same name over and over again, for example, uh, ask some deeper dive questions. So you want to talk about, you know, is this something that is causing distress? Is there anxiety or depression or some other mental health symptoms occurring? Are you noticing anything that's a physical kind of symptom? Are papers and books being torn in their book bag? Are they losing belongings when people are stealing or taking things from them? Are you noticing cuts or bruises on their body? All kinds of different signs and symptoms to pay attention to. And if you're starting to tie those conversations to some of those symptoms and you're noticing that there's distress, those are absolutely times to bring it to an adult at school. So that could be the teacher to start with. It could be the principal or an administrator. If you have a close relationship with someone else in the building, like a school counselor, or whoever your child may be close to, that could be the first person to start those conversations with. Uh, I, I would think that most of our young people who have told us that they've been distressed about the bullying that's happened to them, but felt that no one did anything, was when they told an adult and the adult did not take action. So the most important thing to do as a parent is to take some sort of action to move those conversations forward and to help your child understand that you are going to do something to try to improve the situation. And it may not improve immediately, but for them to see that you're taking action is absolutely critical to your relationship with your child. Okay, and I wanna get back into that idea of the parent taking action versus what action we expect from the school in just a second. But first we wanna say, if you are just joining us, this is an Ohio Learns 360 webinar, and we're discussing bullying, awareness, and prevention.
We'd like to thank Ohio Learns 360 and the Ohio Department of Education for their support of this initiative. The Ohio Learns 360 initiative is a partnership between Ohio's eight PBS stations with support from the Ohio Department of Education. At a statewide level, Ohio Learns 360 will be supporting families, educators, and students through community events, after-school programs, summer programs, and virtual programs like this one. You can learn more at ohiolearns360.org. Now for our audience at home, we want to hear from you. Please use the Q&A function in the webinar to ask a question. Parents know their kids best, so what questions do you have as we dive deeper into this topic? With us tonight is Dr. Jill Jackson, an education program specialist in the Office of Whole Child Supports, and this, this is a part of the Ohio Department of Education. And then also with us is Dr. Cricket Meehan from Miami University, where she is the director for school-based mental health programs. Now, just to get back to that idea of the parent advocating for the student and, you know, emailing the teacher or calling the teacher and saying, I'm, I, I think that we might have a bullying issue. What, what if the student tells someone at school? Um, or is the school supposed to then contact the parent? Should the parent be expecting to hear from an adult at the school? Uh, Dr. Jackson, if you want to take that. Yes, gladly. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about what is required of Ohio schools, again, based on what's in Ohio's anti-harassment, intimidation, and bullying policy. Again, like we have uh, really done a good job of, of looking at the definition of bullying behavior with the components that uh, Dr. Meehan shared. Um, it's aggressive behavior, it is repeated behavior, and there's a power indifference. Not only that, the next pieces are that those behaviors cause mental and physical harm to the student and is, again, sufficiently severe and persistent and creates an intimidating and threatening abusive educational environment. And so those were the things we mentioned early on in the uh, webinar as far as the definition of the behavior. And those are important to the next steps in the policy that say that schools are supposed to have a way to be informed about these behaviors. Schools are, have three ways in which they should make students, staff, and families, their local community, aware of how to report these bullying behaviors <clears throat> when they occur and, and they are made aware of them with their students. One is they should be able to report anonymously, just in case they feel concerned um, about any retaliation in reporting. Two, they should be able to report informally or just be able to just share information with any staff person, teacher, or administrator in the building. Thirdly would be formally, and that would be in which the school has a formal way in which they uh, collect this information for uh, the next step required in the policy, which is conduct an investigation. Um, once schools um, are informed about bullying behavior, they are to investigate um, what was reported and then provide um, interventions. Okay, and Dr. Meehan, do you want to add anything else about what the parent can expect from the school? Um, I, I just wonder how much, you know, there could even be a, a power imbalance there where the parent just feels like, I don't know what to do, um, and how can the school help with that? Yeah, and so what I would say is it's important even before an incident starts to build those relationships with the adults who are in your child's school, especially the teacher and anyone else who has regular contact on a daily basis with your student. Uh, so building those relationships, checking in, uh, making sure that the communication channels are open, so sharing email, um, phone numbers, whatever it is, whatever is the best way for you to communicate back and forth. Starting that early uh, and before there are any problems can be really helpful because what will happen is the teacher then or whoever it is at the school will know your family, they'll know that you're the, the child's guardian or parent, um, and be able to build those relationships and, and understand that when you bring something new to them that's concerning to you, 
that this is something that they need to take very seriously. So, so that's, I think, step one is just build those relationships early. I would also say if you are not receiving um, a response to whatever it is that you're bringing to an adult at the school that you feel is appropriate, don't just stop there. Go to the next person in the school. So if that's another teacher, if that's you know someone in the office or whoever it may be, um, continue to find someone who will listen to the story, listen to what's happening, and um, hopefully be able to provide some solutions. And I think that would be the third thing that I would recommend as a parent is to ask uh, what will happen at school? What will be some of the solutions? What will be some of the strategies that will hopefully help reduce what's happening? Uh, and try to encourage the school, uh, the adults at the school to really share with you specifically what they're planning to do and the steps that they're planning to take. Because as Dr. Jackson mentioned, schools do have requirements on how they need to handle these sorts of incidents and they have policies and procedures that are in place to, to be helpful so that everyone can remain safe. Okay. And this is an Ohio Learns 360 webinar and I'm Amy Jurevich. We're talking about bullying awareness and prevention. And to our audience at home, we wanna hear from you. Has your child been impacted by bullying? You can ask your question in the Q&A portion of this webinar and Amy Palermo from WOSU Classroom will deliver your question to our guests. And I think that Amy Palermo does have a question. We do, we have a question from our audience. Should a parent of a bully child ever contact the parent of the child who is bullying? And then I'll add to that, what if they know each other? Do you have any advice? Yeah, should, should the parent contact the other parent? Um, uh, Dr. Jackson, do you wanna start off with that? So if they know each other, again, like Dr. Meehan was saying, having a relationship is fundamental to ensuring uh, the reduction of these behaviors and creating a safe space for students. If parents know each other, one, have a healthy relationship, two, and are able to have a conversation in which they can share their concerns in a way in which is solution-based and um, outcome-driven for the students, then that, that would be optimal. Oftentimes, um, parents have to be able to um, separate uh, maternal emotions. I know I'm a mom, so sometimes it, that's a that's a challenging space. But being able to be driven towards what is required for schools um, for themselves. In other words, what are the interventions going to be? What are the res resolutions going to be for ensuring um, the behaviors um, do not continue? and that the students stay safe. So if the parents, one, have a healthy relationship, can maintain that for resolution of the students, and then um, kind of end up in a space in which they have some um, pretty specific steps for the students to follow in a way in which um, the behaviors are, are being eliminated and, and students are, stay, are able to stay safe during the school day. Dr. Just, yeah, uh, yeah what you go ahead. This is a really wonderful opportunity for parents in the relationships with each other to model positive communication and solution focused and, and great relationship skills. So if parents are able to do that, then their young people are going to benefit from learning those skills in watching those interactions happen. And Dr. Meehan, earlier you were talking about how the school, you need to ask the school what solutions they're going to provide. So what step they're going to be taking. Um, can you dive a little deeper into that? So what could, what solutions should schools be providing? Because, um, you know, as a parent, the school can tell me, well, we're going to make sure they don't sit next to each other or uh, we're going to make sure, you know, X, Y, and Z. Is, what kind of things should the parent be looking for for the school to be saying, these are the solutions? Yeah, will absolutely depend on the situation. But some of the most important things are that whatever the solution is, if it is separating by physical space, that, that can be a solution. Um, if it's ensuring that that young person has a peer or someone who they can go to to support them throughout the day, uh, having an adult that they can talk to, whatever the solution is, 
a really critical piece of it is following up long term. So coming back later, maybe in a couple of days or in a week, and the adults at school checking in and following up and ensuring that there has been changes in the behaviors and that the problematic behavior isn't as occurring as much or not at all. Um, and so that's something that I think when we often talk about bullying, we want to figure out what's going to happen right away and end that situation. And that's good. But we need to think about long term because, again, this is a repeated behavior. So we need to follow up regularly and have adults who are checking in. And there needs to be a period of time where that does occur. So schools should share with the parents, you know, who will be the person doing that checking in? Uh, how often will it happen and how long will it happen? And then provide some regular feedback to the parents on on what's happening at school. Okay. If I may, yeah. I would like to add to that. So the Ohio Department of Education, um, the Anti-Harassment, Intimidation, and Bullying Initiative, in which Dr. Meehan is a part of, um, she has described steps that we offer to Ohio schools through what's called um, action planning. Um, and so through action planning, um, we recommend that there, there, is a plan, there is a plan in place that's inclusive of um, the family, um, the school, and that could include uh, like Dr. Meehan said, peers, it could include any school staff. Um, you know, it may be the, te the teacher in the classroom that is of concern, or it could be some other staff in the building. Um, hopefully inclusive of the administrator as well, because you want that level of leadership support uh, for your student safety. And so um, a team approach is needed because you have to restore trust and safety for students, as well as like Dr. Meehan was saying, ensure it for the rest of the school year. So you would have an action planning team for your students so that immediate action can be taken for their safety. And then that team would meet. And that team would really um, hear out the students' needs. Again, kind of going through that um, five whys again. The who, what, when, where, why, and how bullying is occurring for them. So that everyone is on the same page. Everyone has the same information. And everyone is understanding the students' experiences from the students' lens more so than from theirs. Because... Adults can dictate and determine things that may not and that may not provide a good intervention fit for addressing and, and resolving the behaviors for the student. Once this uh, the student's needs are heard um, by the team of support for the student, then that's when everyone would kind of say, here's what we can do uh, maybe in the morning to address these concerns, midday and then end of day, and really walk through the student's school day based on what they have shared and provide. Um, prevention, intervention, or response strategies for what the student is expressing. That way, everyone knows what the interventions are, and the student is even able to say, yes, this is going to be something that's successful for me. I've heard through the years, and Dr. Meehan the same, um, people saying um, the school did something, but it didn't work, hmm. right? And that's oftentimes because um, interventions are put in place um, that aren't a best fit for what the students' experiences are. So this um, action planning team approach is necessary so that, again, everyone's on the same page and we're certain that the interventions provided are a best fit to resolve, eliminate, and deter these behaviors from occurring. And then the last piece that Dr. Meehan said is that this is an ongoing process for uh, the balance of the school year. It's not a uh, one-time occurrence. It's not a one-time conversation or a meeting with this team. It's a team of support that really has guidance driven from the student and family. Um, and then with a, a definitive interventions in place, and then you all say, how are we gonna follow up and when are we gonna follow up? Um, are we going to follow up um, in person, you know, phone, text, social media, however, is determined. And then how frequently is it going to be every other day, once a week, twice a uh, month or monthly, whatever is needed for that student's individualized plan of support. And then that is maintained for the balance of the school year. And we're doing as, again, Dr. Meehan referenced, um, what we call progressive monitoring. Um, okay, everything is really going great in the morning, but after lunch, we ran into a hiccup. And so you don't throw out the whole plan and you don't throw out the whole team. You just kind of take the team and you narrow in and you say, what happened after lunch? And you kind of go through those five whys again. And you kind of, where do you need to adjust, shift interventions, change um, focus, and then keep teaming and supporting the student so that their full day for the rest of the year is safe and supported with interventions that everyone is aware of, which is hugely important. Schools making sure everyone is aware. A lot of times parents 
are concerned. They say the school said they're going to do anything, but we don't see it or we're, we're not uh, feeling safe. And so this really addresses and resolves that so that everyone is on the same page working together and the student's safety can be restored and supported for the balance of the year through action planning. Lastly, that resource that Dr. Meehan and I just walked through can be found on the Ohio Department of Education website. You type in um, bullying on the webpage and on you get the first link, which is the anti-harassment, intimidation, and bullying resources link. There's a lot of great stuff on there for parents, even a tab for parents um, on the left. But then also in the middle of the resource page is the document guidance for action plan planning, which parents can take with them after this webinar to utilize um, to work with schools if they need so to uh, eliminate bullying behavior with their student. Okay, and I know we have another question from our audience at home. Um, so, and you can ask your question using the Q&A function of this webinar. And Amy Palermo, what's the next question? Our next question, uh, if you have a student or child who does not open up easily and does not really let you know that they're being bullied, but you think there's something going on, how do you proceed? Dr. So Mahan, often, do you want to take that? Yeah. Often just being with a young person, being in the same room with them, um, and allowing them the space and the time to open up or to talk when they're ready. It doesn't always have to be verbal. So there are other options. I mean, there are idea, the idea of, you know, maybe using drawings or maybe using music or other avenues um, to, to try to get that student comfortable in what's happening and then able to talk to that adult. And as Dr. Jackson mentioned, if the first adult isn't the right fit, maybe there's someone else in the building or maybe another peer who could talk with that young person. So it's just trying things over and over again uh, and, until you get to something that's working well. And then, um, you know, that, that really is just not giving up, like just repeating the process over and over and over um, and to ensure that safety is the number one concern. And I wanted to talk for a little bit about this idea. So we're talking about bullying awareness and prevention. So a part of the prevention is related to what you just said. It, there's a, a social and emotional learning component to elementary school and teaching students how to be empathetic individuals and how to have awareness of what's going on around them. So can we talk a little bit about how the all the students in the class can help make sure there's no bullying going on amongst them, uh, you know, being advocates for each other. Um, Dr. Jackson, do you want to talk a little bit about just the being aware of others? Sure. I'm going to provide a leading framework for Ohio schools, and then I'll allow Dr. Meehan to fill in uh, all the good stuff. Um, <laughs> so in Ohio, um, all schools are required to implement positive behavioral interventions and supports, also known as PBIS. It addresses what we call three tiers of needs for addressing student behavior. Tier one are universal needs that um, all students uh, should receive. And those are, again, your fundamental social, emotional uh, skills and supports so that their uh, students have healthy behaviors, healthy relationships, know how are self-aware and are able to uh, self-manage and regulate their behaviors uh, for themselves and then in um, relationship with their peers. Tier two are where um, students uh, may have a bit of a challenge with this and may need some additional uh, supports. Uh, evidence-based programs is what we recommend in this space or evidence-based practices so that students are able to learn. Um, skills, uh, emotion, social emotional skills, if you will, so that they can learn how to better self-regulate, have more what we call protective factors than risk factors, and are able to um, engage in a, in, in a healthy way during the school day with, um, with their peers. And then tier three are students that may already have um, plans um, and supports in place with, uh, uh, within the school or within the community um, and along with their families, even oftentimes at um, tier three to support um, their best behavior um, in school. So tier one is um, in PBIS is um, the place in which we would focus in response to your question, however, to ensure that what we call um, school-wide practices. And then here's the really good part that I get so excited about. 
<laughs> in this requirement. It's not just for students. It's for staff and students. And so that is the comprehensive approach that we are really excited about in Ohio schools, that this good work is for everyone. And because teachers have to create a positive school culture and one in which bullying behavior is not um, considered or encouraged. And the, again, like Dr. Meehan mentioned, um, with parents um, modeling, teaching and modeling all the time of these behaviors uh, for every student in the school, um, every staff um, as well are able to establish a positive school culture and climate in which um, the norm is that there is not uh, bullying behavior and it's not encouraged or a space in which it's allowed. Yeah, Dr. Meehan, do you wanna weigh in on this idea of the of what's being taught and modeling the behavior, um, not just with adults, but you know, amongst other students? So how can everyone help prevent bullying? Yeah, I think one of the things that we need to think about is that every interaction that we have and every relationship that we're building matters and our words matter, our actions matter. Uh, we as adults are role models and mentors to our young people. And I think we need to always remember that we are not only engaging in our interactions, but everyone around us is learning from them. And so I think it, it is, again, opportunities for the adults to be mentors, for the young people to learn how to engage with each other, um, for adults to say, you know, maybe that interaction that you had with each other didn't really work out so well and, and talk about how it made each other feel and really dig in deeper so that our students can learn more. So it is, it's all practice. It's really engaging in those relationships that are positive. It's learning those skills like Dr. Jackson mentioned. And these are things that we can do over and over again. So it's it's a repetitive process. And just to add on to that, can we talk a little bit about the, the bystander effect? Mm -hmm. So um, what if, what if your child comes home and says, you know, Billy's being mean to, you know, the, uh, being mean to this other kid? Um, what, what should you do as a parent? Should you, like, how do you guide your kid to help in that aspect? Because if it's happening, I have to imagine that other students are noticing, even if it's not directly impacting them. Dr. Meehan, do you have any advice about, you know, what a bystander in the class should be doing? Yeah, I would say, you know, a lot of times our young people don't know what to do and they don't know how to intervene or they may not feel safe to intervene. And so they don't need to directly um, interact with the person who's engaging in bullying behavior. They don't need to stop it directly, but they can do something as simple as when they've noticed something happening to someone else to say to them, even if it's later, I'm really sorry that that happened to you. Or when I saw that, I didn't, that didn't make me feel good. Um, and so those kinds of behaviors, I think, are things that young people can engage in and they're safe. And that's something that we can share with um, anyone who's experienced or witnessed what's happening. And thank you again for joining us for this Ohio Learns 360 webinar. We're talking to, about bullying, awareness, and prevention. I'm Amy Jurovich. And to our audience at home, have you had to talk with your child about bullying? And have you had to talk with the school about it? Please ask your question in the Q&A portion of this webinar. And Amy Palermo from WOSU Classroom will deliver your question to our guests. And this is Ohio Learns 360 webinar. It's a part of an initiative between Ohio's eight PBS stations with support from the Ohio Department of Education. At the statewide level, Ohio Learns 360 is supporting families, educators, and students through virtual programs, including series like this one. You can always find out more at ohiolearns360.org. And I also want to um, talk for a moment about the idea of kindness. So everyone wants to be a kind person. I mean, that and you want to be around kind people. So um, can we talk a little bit, uh, Dr. Jackson, about how to just spread the idea of kindness, but without kindness becoming, I feel like at sometimes the word kindness is just thrown around so much and everyone's like, be kind, be kind, that it becomes kind of meaningless. So how do you instill in your child and have them take that to school, the idea of kindness? 
Carl, that is such, that's a truly important question. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I think that um, talking about um, kindness um, in various ways is very important. Um, in addition to talking with your student about kindness in various ways, um, giving examples when, when kindness occurs, um, really pointing that out and saying that was a really cool thing. And then talking about how that felt, what was that experience like? And talking about how good that felt, that really helps um, with the experience and makes students um, really take in that good feeling, um, let that linger and really uh, have an exchange about that experience. So that kind of becomes embedded. And, and not only do they, can they um, talk about it and it's a cognitive process, but it's also an experiential piece that they know how that uh, feels as well as what, what that means. I'm going to stretch that over uh, uh, again to the schools because this should be a shared relationship between families and schools and all, all three groups really working together to create safety. So families talking with their students about kindness in various ways and what that means and what how they experience that, as well as with that PBIS work I just talked about, positive behavioral interventions and supports. Tier one usually offers what's called behavioral expectations. So oftentimes you'll see in schools things like be kind, um, be patient, be supportive, or, or things like that. And so those are additional ways in which teaching kindness can carry from home to school. Oftentimes with PBIS, because it is a district-wide initiative, it includes family and community conversations around what are behavioral expectations um, for kindness or uh, to create safe schools. And when schools really um, implement PBIS to the extent in which families and communities are involved, you can have common messages um, to talk about at home and that are reinforced in school and in the classroom that really help to create a culture of kindness um, that is consistent and hopefully giving students, again, a safe um, learning environment and, and, and school experience during the day. Yeah, Dr. Mann, do you want to add anything about that? Like, you can wear a t-shirt that says be kind, but that doesn't necessarily mean that ev everyone is being kind all the time in the classroom. So can you talk a little bit more about the idea of kindness versus the awareness and respect that you need for your fellow students? Right. So I think, you know, kindness is something that we have to learn what that looks like. We have to understand what are the actions we take that actually show that we're being kind. Um, it's not something that is simply a lip service kind of word. So, you know, we don't just get to say, I'm a kind person and not have the actions that show that. So again, uh, I, I think this repeated message that I've talked about throughout today that we're building relationships and, and we're describing what the behaviors are that our young people can do. And we as adults are role models for that. So we can show what a kind act looks like in a lot of different settings and in a lot of different ways. And sometimes kind actions may look different to different people, but I think the more that we're teaching our young people what, do, what, what, what different things we can do to be kind look like, that will help. And I think that gets into this idea that it isn't simply, uh, you know, just a word on a T-shirt. It really becomes a value that is part of who we are. And so families can instill these values. Schools can instill these values. And it's something that we need to do again over and over again. And we need to show that we're committed to all of these different values, kindness being one of them. When we do that, when we're committed and we're showing that, that's when we get to this idea of being respectful of others. So we're showing that we're being respectful by engaging in these positive things with those around us. Um, and I think that's something that as parents, we can do that with our young people. Uh, in our schools, we can encourage them to uh, you know, go to school and engage in that. And then again, asking them, asking them, how have you been kind to others today? Or how have you respected others? How have you been part of the solution as opposed to being part of the problematic behavior? And I think that's going to be where we're going to see a difference when it comes to bullying behavior being reduced and having less experience if we have more people that are engaged in those positive things. Uh, yes, I, uh, and Dr. Jackson, do you wanna add anything else about that? 
Well, I do, but um, it's going to just uh, take us uh, just a bit into another area. But I, I, I would, I would be remiss if I ended this without saying that Ohio's anti-harassment, intimidation, and bullying policy is intended to address student-to-student -student behavior. I thought I saw a comment earlier, and I want to make sure that I let um, everyone know that if you have concerns about adult behavior or adults not being kind, or adults not modeling this behavior, or even following um, Ohio's anti-harassment, intimidation, and bullying policy, or your local dis district um, anti-harassment, intimidation, and bullying policy, it becomes a matter of professional conduct. Professional conduct is um, different, has different um, requirements uh, regarding addressing the behavior of staff in Ohio schools. And so we always really have to uh, kind of uh, separate that work and look at student behavior and what's going on and ensuring and promoting their kindness and providing interventions if they're not. And however, if staff are uh, responsible for these behaviors and uh, being displaying bullying behavior, it's a matter of professional conduct in relationship to their employment and, and work in the district. So I just wanted to uh, kind of uh, make a connection there, but at the same time, make sure I address that before uh, we, we conclude. And I did want to take a moment to talk a little bit about cyberbullying because a, a lot, I think a lot of the bullying that we've been talking about is an in-person situation. Now, we're talking about elementary school age kids, so the idea of cyberbullying might be um, not quite there yet. Maybe they're not on devices as much or they don't have ac as much access to devices and other people on those devices as older kids. But we could get in there whenever you get the third graders, fourth graders, fifth graders. Um, can you talk a little bit about what parents need to look out for when it comes to the idea of cyberbullying, Dr. Meehan? Yeah, so cyberbullying can happen on a lot of different devices, phones, iPads, uh, computers, whatever, and it can happen in school settings, out of school settings, and it tends to be fairly pervasive and can cross uh, the home and the school line. So a lot of school bullying, if it's in-person kinds of things, stays within the school and the same at home. Uh, with cyberbullying, it really does. It can happen and impact our young people throughout their entire day. And it's harder to turn it off and to get away from it. And so it's something that parents need to ask about, to talk about. And really, especially when our students are younger, those are the best times to start those conversations about how to be a good, positive digital citizen. What does all of those values and those behaviors look like in that online setting? And then providing them with, you know, examples and, and ways to practice those behaviors, but then also having that open relationship to uh, have them report to you when those things, when, when uncomfortable or uh, bullying type things are happening in those online settings. So again, it's, it's something really for parents to be aware of and to have those open conversations about. Dr. Jackson, I have to think that you know, some of your policies that you've been talking about also incorporate cyberbullying into that as well. What's in the definition mm -hmm. that I, I spoke to um, from at the beginning of the webinar? And so if uh, bullying behavior occurs online, it is inclusive of the bullying behavior that should be addressed by the school. What schools will be challenged by and will have to um, find ways to support is when this happens outside of school hours. And so uh, schools are oftentimes concerned about how to address that. But what I say to them is, if what occurred online outside of school hours impacts the school day, then it is still, um, be, there are still behaviors that uh, are concerning and should follow action planning guidance and interventions should be in place to ensure the students feel safe and don't feel the school is a threatening environment because of online activity that took place outside of the school day. So it, it should follow the same um, policy um, practices and addressing the students' behavioral needs so that everyone um, feels safe. And we're down to our last couple of minutes. So I just wanted to end with each of you um, giving us just um, a little bit more about resources that parents can use. If you have just a little more advice for the parents who will be listening to this webinar about what they should do if bullying has impacted their life or you know, a particular websites you wanna point them to. So Dr. Meehan, if you'd like to start. And I know Dr. Jackson knows what I'm going to say because I love the Search Institute and the Search Institute's website has some amazing resources. 
Uh, so searchinstitute.org, I believe, is their website. But if you were to Google Search Institute, you'll find them. Uh, they have the Developmental Relationships Framework, and this is a wonderful resource that gives you actionable strategies on how to build those relationships that we kept talking about today. So there is a guidance document in there. I highly recommend parents to take a look at that and to think about how you can incorporate some of those strategies into your relationships with, with your young people because it really will start to make a difference and you'll start having more open conversations. Uh, your young person will be sharing more with you and you'll be able to hopefully engage and have more positive experiences and safer experiences as a family. Dr. Jackson, are there resources that you wanna point parents to here as we end? Search Institute for sure, Ohio Department of Education, in the search type in the word bullying and go to the anti-harassment intimidation and bullying resources page. It is chock full of resources with uh, families and educators in mind to work together locally to ensure student safety. And then lastly, I put the federal resource stopbullying.gov. And it is again, a wealth of resources for families, students and schools to again, stop bullying across the country. Okay, well, thank you so much. And this has been Ohio Learns 360 webinar. Thank you for joining us. And thank you to Dr. Cricket Meehan from Miami University. Thank you for being here. And also thank you to Dr. Jill Jackson from the Ohio Department of Education. Thank you. And your feedback on tonight's topic and, and to help inform future topics by completing a brief survey. The QR code and the URL on your screen now. If you are not able to take a photo right now, a link will be emailed in the next 24 hours to anyone who registered for tonight's event. And we want you to join us again on Wednesday, December 14th for our next topic, advocating for your child and connecting with their school. Thank you to Ohio Learns 360 and the Ohio Department of Education for this event. And also thank you to Amy Palermo with WOSU Classroom and thank you to the television production team at WOSU for making this event possible. You can watch other webinars in this series and find more information on upcoming virtual events, including links to register by visiting our website at ohiolearns360.org. I'm Amy Jurevich. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.